So let's look at it carefully. We've got lots of factory options. Uh, we got the whole PRR, guess and check thing. Um, but what do you notice about this numerator? You can uh, factor it by grouping. It can factor by grouping. So that is always faster. So I'm going to go ahead and factor it by grouping. And today it works, yesterday it didn't. So I've got um, x squared minus 4. Oh, what about x squared minus 4? You can factor that. I can factor that too. And my denominator factors, did you notice that? So I think the whole shebang factors pretty easily. Did you get it factored? You get it factored? What do you notice? There's a hole. You can cancel something out. So we're ultimately going to end up graphing x plus 2, x minus 2 over x minus 5. Everybody in agreement? That's what we're going to graph. But because we could cancel, our picture is going to have a hole. And where will that hole be? Negative where x is negative 3? Is that 0 negative 3? No, x is negative 3. How do I find the y coordinate? Plug it back in. I plug, plug it back in to that problem up there. So I'm going to have negative 3 plus 2, which is negative 1. Negative 3 minus 2, which is negative 5. And negative 3 minus 5, which is negative 8. So what does that end up being? Negative 5 eighths. Negative 5 eighths. So negative 3, negative 5 eighths. I have an open an opening in my picture. Curve is going to pass through there. All right, what else do I have in my picture? Look at, look at your equation right here. What else do I have? Horizontal asymptote at x equals 5. I have a vertical asymptote at x equals 5, right? A vertical at x equals 5? No. What, Peter? I'm going to have to do the division because the power on top, this is really x squared minus 4, right? Isn't this my problem? And the power on top is bigger, which means the end behavior asymptote will not be horizontal. But there is an end behavior asymptote. To find it, I will have to do the division. If it's just like a single, like x over x, like x refers to x refers, is that an asymptote of one or just not? That's a horizontal asymptote of one. If it's x over x, that's one. Test? How do I know what? That there isn't a horizontal asymptote? No, that there's, or whatever, is the identification. Because the power on top is bigger than the power on the bottom. Uh, so there's no horizontal asymptote. It must be slanted. Okay? As long as the power is bigger on the bottom. Then, you're, then you have a horizontal asymptote of zero. Uh, because you'll have like zero, zero x squared mm -hmm. over five x squared or something. All that stuff, we, we learned all that way back from the last class. Okay, now, we have a vertical asymptote of 5. We know we have a slant asymptote. So I'm going to have to figure out where it is. So I'm going to do my division, carefully putting in a 0 where it belongs. I know I'm going to get a remainder, but I don't care what it is. This is the part of the division I care about. It gives me my asymptote, which is where? X plus five. Y equals X plus five. So my end behavior asymptote is Y equals X plus five. 
and this just stinks because I'm going to be behind the board over there. So now that I've done all this, I'm going to move my picture. We got our hole in there. We have our in behavior asymptote. We have our vertical asymptote. So what else can I put in my picture? There's a couple other things that need to go in there. I need my intercepts. So if I go back to this, it's really <laughs> obvious that my x intercepts are at negative 2 and 2. Because if you plug in, let's say two, you're going to get zero. That's what an x intercept is, it gives you zero. And then if we let the x's be zero, like these where they were here, if we let the x's be zero, we get four fifths. So it's all getting very crunched up there in my picture. But I have x intercepts at negative 2 and 2, and the y intercept at 4 fifths. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, somehow I have to figure out what this picture looks like, and I think this part's really easy. Right? It's not really a parabola, but it has kind of that shape. Because remember, it has to follow its asymptote. Go through the hole, go through all these intercepts, and follow that asymptote. So doesn't that make sense, given the shape that we have? But you aren't done. You guys, you aren't done. All you have drawn is the part on the left side of the picture. What is going to be on the right side? Up in that little corner. Up in this little corner, right here. Right here. You are exactly right. And then zero minus zero gives you times around. Now, maybe you kind of just felt that because <coughs> reciprocal-ish type functions are usually in opposite quadrants. So maybe you just felt that that's what it was going to be. Or maybe you said to yourself, it can't be here. Because if it were here, it would have to cross the x-axis, and it can't. Well, by process of elimination, it must be up there. What I need you to remember is, you're graphing on the entire domain, okay? That means all the x's. So you have to have something on the left side of the asymptote, and vertical asymptote, and something on the right side of the asymptote, okay? Make sure you grab something on both sides of your vertical asymptote. So even though there were no points over here, we knew there had to be a piece of graph over there. Right? The vertical asymptote? Is yes. that just like a... Do something I made up. Yes, it's something you need to do. No. But like what? What? Why? Yeah, on the vertical asymptote. You don't grab any on that you graph on both sides of the vertical asymptote. X less than five, X greater than five. The that's the domain of the problem. Except for the little hole that we've already graphed in there. You have to graph it on its whole domain. You can't just skip part of it. Okay. So what? What does the hole do? Are you supposed to go through it? Jump over it. But it's part of the curve. It connects on both sides. But you don't. Okay. Yeah. It's not part of the graph, but, but the curve it. connects on both sides. As opposed to an asymptote, 
that you don't know. But you don't connect on both sides. You run on both sides, but you don't connect them. Okay, all right. So in that one picture, we had just about everything. We had a hole. Where do those come from? Uh, what is the answer? And so you're going to factor your problem. If things don't cancel, that's fine. It just means you don't have any holes. If they do, you have a hole. And the hole, the x coordinate is a point. The x coordinate is whatever the factor was that you canceled out. The y comes from plugging the x back into your equation, and that will give you the y. Vertical asymptotes come from the what they cannot be, x cannot be, so it's a denominator thing, whatever's in the denominator. And behavior asymptotes, you're, you're going to have a situation like this, where the end behavior asymptote would be horizontal, y equals 2. Or you're going to have a situation like this, like we did, where your end behavior asymptote will be slant. You'll find it doing the division literally doing the long division or you'll have a situation like this which has a slant or has a horizontal asymptote of zero because the power on top is smaller than the power on the bottom um on the homework that's due on thursday it's, it brings up a slant what is what is that a is slant that, asymptote that that's and behavior asymptote that's what okay. we just found they're found by dividing yeah and then um what else did we have? Oh, we had intercepts. So the intercepts are where you cross the x-axis. So they're, they're the x's that give you zero, and they're the y that comes when x is zero. Those are your intercepts. And by the time you get all that graph, hopefully you can figure out what it looks like. But if you can't, so then you get a little t-chart and you plot whatever points you need to plot to give you a feeling for where it is. Okay? All right, number two, not a graph, just a solve. Um, because we're short on time, I'm gonna go ahead and factor that denominator as I copy it down. Wouldn't you agree that's the good that's a good first step? Or that's what I should do. Now this one is a little bit tricky because do you see how this one is the backwards of that one? That that is could cause me a bunch of extra work unless I can make a match. So what would it take to turn this one around? Multiplying by, Multiply by negative one. So if I make if I make this a plus, can I make that x minus 1? Yeah. Wouldn't you have to multiply everything by negative 1 then? That's what I did. I multiplied this by negative 1 and this by negative 1. It's going to cancel those out and turn that into a plus, and it's going to make this x minus 1. And we don't need to do the first yeah. one? We may not need to do the, the first one. The two over all of that? No, no, no. no. I just did it within this fraction right here. Oh. I do not know where the confusion is coming from. I'm trying to remain calm. Am I allowed to multiply top and bottom of the fraction by anything I want? Anything I want. All right. What happens when I have a negative, negative one? It's a positive. And what happens when I multiply a one by a negative one? I get negative one, and negative one times negative x, I get x, right? Okay, now what am I going to do here? So I'm going to multiply everything by x plus 4 and x minus 1. Now, we know what's going to happen, so I'm not telling you you have to write all this down, because you know what's going to happen. You know stuff's going to cancel. But 
what I need you to understand <coughs> is you are multiplying everything by the same thing. You can't just multiply this fraction by one thing and this one by another and this one by another. If we're going to clear them out, we're going to multiply by the same thing. So we end up with x minus 1 equal to 2 plus x plus 4. This does not look good, does it? Because it says x minus 1 equals x plus 6. Oh my, no solution. That problem probably wasn't out of the book. I probably made that one up, and that's why that happened. Normally, what would happen is, if your teacher could do this, you would come up with like x equals 7 or something. Then you want to make sure that it works in the problem. So in this case, if you solved it, you could not use negative 4 or positive 1 as answers, if that had happened. All right, now we're getting our calculators out, because these problems require a calculator. And we're going to mix some acid together. So everybody good with the setup? You can use other setups. I, I don't care. This is the setup I use. If you have your own way of doing it, that's fine. Um, what are, what's that? How much am I going to end up with? This is the amount that I'm ending up with if I mix together x and 10. X and 10. So what would that give me? X plus 10. X plus 10. Now, I just want to back up for a second. Suppose that I was mis mixing x of 90 and sum of 10, or sum of 37, I mean, to end up with 80 of 75. Suppose that was the problem. So I'm mixing sum 90 with sum 37 to end up with 80 ounces of 75%. What would that look like? 80 minus 80 minus 6. So when you set these up, almost always, you're going to be mixing some of this with some of this to get some of that. So you either need to figure out what this is or what this is. So if you're combining them, obviously it's going to be plus. If the total is 80, then this would be 80 minus whatever you have in the beginning. Okay, so let me just work it out like a regular equation. So we're good with that. <coughs> All right, Dick's Sporting Goods has determined that it needs to sell its soccer shin guards for $5.25 a pair in order to be competitive. It costs $4.32 to produce each pair, and the weekly overhead cost is $4,000. Find the number of shin guards that must be sold each week to make $8,000 profit. Okay. Profit. Like, money after like an initial expense. Okay, so profit. 
topics is um, my income minus my expenses. Whatever I have left, that's my profit. Is that what you're saying? Okay. So what are, what is the income? for Dick Sporting Goods in terms of shin guards. How much money are they bringing in? 4,000. Nope. 525X. 525X. Will what X be the number of shin guards sold? And then, the, oops, and then this is how much money they're making. Would you agree with that? 525 a pair. What they're bringing in. Okay. Now, how much are they paying out? Well, they're paying out a couple of things. What are they paying out? 4.32x. 4.32x. And what else are they paying out? $4,000. What's overhead? The cost to run your business. Cost to run the business. So it's the lights. It's the rent on the building, it's the taxes, it's the water bill, it's the sewage, it's all that stuff. They're paying that, if they don't make a single shin guard, they have to pay this much money. Then they're paying 432 a pair on top of that. Could you just do like 93 cents X or whatever? Yes, yes, combine those, yeah, absolutely. And then, what do I want the profit to be? 8,000. Eight I think we can solve that equation. Uh, you, you've already figured out what is it? 93 cents? Mm -hmm. Minus 4,000 is 8,000. So they got to sell a lot of shin guards. Twelve thousand nine hundred and three. Actually, probably twelve thousand nine hundred and four pairs of shin guards. Because if I don't sell that many, I won't make four eight thousand dollars, right? I'll make a little more than eight thousand this way. But that's how many pairs. All right, everybody okay with that? Now, number five, I'm going to modify. This is another one of Ms. Granola's things, but I'm going to modify it a little bit. I got 525 feet of fencing, all right? So here I am with 525 feet of fencing. I want to fence in my backyard. I'm going to want to make it the biggest, or let's say I'm going to fence in a pasture. I want to make it as big as I possibly can with my 525 feet of fencing. And I'm going to use my barn as one side of the fence. Okay, how many of you have a fence in the backyard? Doesn't the house serve as one side? So that's what I mean. Only I got a barn. Here's my barn. And now I'm going to put a fence out here. And I have 500, this is the fence. I have 525 feet of fencing. And I want to maximize the area that I can fence in. Got it? So I'm modifying the problem a little bit. I want to maximize the area. Okay, so it's a rectangle. I'm assuming a rectangular area, or it says that, I think. So, um, <clears throat> what shall I do here? Could we just do 525 divided by 3535? Well, let's see if it works out that way. We can't do that because you're assuming that that's going to be whatever. I don't, it may work out that way, but let's let's figure that out. Well, if I call this X, what's this? X. What's this? Y. 525 Y, but I might call it 525 minus 2X, because I really don't want to have another variable if I don't need it. Okay, so would everybody agree if I have 525 feet of fencing? But I got an X and an X, and then this would be 525 minus 2X. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the area then? 
this rectangle. The area is? Five minus two x times x. Mm -hmm. Minus five minutes. So that's negative two x squared plus 525x, if I go ahead and distribute it. Now, I distributed it because I want you to see a couple of things. Is that a rectangle? I would think. Is that a parabola? Yeah. Yes. And it opens down. down. And so the maximum will be just its vertex. And we can find the vertex by doing negative B over 2A. So I gotta read the question again. Um, find the maximum area. So 131.25 is not the maximum area. That would be the length of this side. <coughs> so how would I find the maximum area? You, you can plug it back into here if you want. Or you can go ahead and find this side and then just multiply them together. Whatever works for you. So let's see. So this is 262.5. <coughs> so I got my area is 34,453.125 square feet. <coughs> Anybody else get that? So Leah, I don't think your idea worked. It's a good guess, good guess. Wish it had been that easy, but it wasn't. All right. Oh, All right. We'll go. We'll go lunch. We'll solve this last when we get back, and then we gotta take some more notes. That's enough for you.